At its very core, drug science must remain independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. It's with the support of the drug science community we're able to do this and make the podcast in the first place. If you're able to become a drug science community member and support the show, you too will be supporting the dissemination of evidence-based drug policies. Without you, none of this would be possible. For anybody interested, there's a link in the show notes. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. Well, hello and welcome to another Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Today I'm delighted to be talking to Rose Cartwright, who is a writer, a producer and also a sufferer. As I just mentioned to her before we came live, uh, we share two considerable interests. One is in OCD and the other is in psychedelics. Now, of course, my interest in, in OCD came after we started getting interested in psychedelics because we have been doing a study using psycholytic levels, 10 milligrams of psilocybin in people with OCD with some interesting effects. I think OCD started first with you, did it? Whereas I think Rose came to it the other from the other direction, didn't you? Yeah, OCD and I have a very long history together, yes. I started having what I conceptualised at the time as OCD symptoms as long ago as when I was 15 years old. So, yeah, it's been a big part of my life, a big part of my adult life. So, I mean, 15 is not, you know, it's a reason, that's an age in which OCD often, you know, sometimes it starts before then as well. What did you, people would be very interested to know what you noticed and, and how you try to make sense of it. Yeah, so when I was 15, I was living at home where I grew up uh, in the black country in the West Midlands. And there was not much awareness of various ways that mental health problems can manifest. And I was having a very difficult time on various fronts growing up and my distress manifested quite explosively when I was 15 as repetitive intrusive thoughts, intrusive violent and sexual thoughts that really seemed to come out of nowhere and started looping in my mind pretty much 24-7 with really startling vividness and intensity and I was compulsively trying to get these thoughts out of my mind or trying anything that I could to try and combat them, rationalise them, make them go away. And my efforts were fruitless. They only seemed to get worse and worse. And there was a, a whole cluster of other internal experiences, a great deal of shame associated with having these thoughts that I felt too taboo to tell, any, tell anybody about. I was also self-harming. In my later teens, I developed bulimia and then a lot of suicidal ideation and really just, um, you know, I was sort of cyclically breaking down throughout my late teens and early 20s. And I started writing about it um, and sort of became known for, for speaking about the experience of having intrusive thoughts and how terrifying that can be. Well, let's just come to that in a minute. But I mean, how long... Did it take you to seek help? Or, you know, how long did you suffer it alone in, in that sense? It was about three years before I felt brave enough to go to a doctor and say, hey, I'm having these really distressing intrusive thoughts. I, I wasn't using the language intrusive thoughts at the time, just these, instru- these distressing thoughts about all these taboo themes and I don't know what to do about it. I feel like I'm losing my mind. And I was 18 at the time. And at that point, I was put on antidepressants, which... Sorry, so you went to a GP, did you? Or did you go to a psychiatrist? I went to a GP, yeah. And the antidepressants seemed to have a sort of global numbing effect, really sort of like took the top and bottom off my emotional range, but didn't do anything to stop the thoughts. And... That was a that was a sort of my my first disappointment in my journey of seeking psychiatric help for my problems. Did you see a psychiatrist, or did, was it all done through primary care? Eventually, I did. Yeah. So when it, so I went off to university at Leeds, and then that's when I was seeing doctors more regularly. I got referred to psychiatrists. 
was prescribed different medications that also didn't do anything to stop the thoughts, was offered various types of therapy, psychodynamic and person-centered therapy. And none of this really seemed to help at at all, unfortunately. Mm. But did writing about it help then? Writing is a sort of a kind of a kind of go-to like processing mode for me it's sort of how I sort of make sense of myself and the world around me so yes it's um it's sort of really integral to to sort of lending meaning to the suffering that I've experienced but um in and of itself I don't necessarily think it helped I mean I was very I was in a quite a serious state of 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 constant stress for, for many many years and I think writing and talking about it sort of only really kind of scratched the surface of the problem. Initially, it did help when I discovered that intrusive thoughts could be thought of as a symptom of OCD and that there were other people out there in the world who were experiencing the same thing. That brought with it a, an immense amount of relief that, you know, this the, these weren't experiences that I was alone with because that was my big fear. I was like, I'm the only person in the world that feels like this, that is capable of feeling such terrible things. So when I landed on an OCD diagnosis, um, that felt like a, a lifeline. It was a, it felt at the time like a big turning point. And I think in retrospect, although my diagnosis was very comforting, you know, the, the sort of the, the routes to wellness from there were really not open to me through traditional channels. And so that, so more, more disappointment followed. <laughs> Yes, obviously. I mean, I think the research we have in terms of sort of behaviour, CBT for for OCD tends to focus on what to be certainly better evidence for behaviours rather than thinking. It's a different kind of model, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You didn't have obsessional behaviours. It was always thoughts, was it? Well, yeah. I mean, that you know, those intrusive thoughts can be thought of as obsessions. You know, they're just they're not they're not, and and the compulsions are there as well, but they're just not overt you know the compulsive behavior you know the you know classically people think of compulsive behavior as you know perhaps like you know cleaning germs off a tabletop for example but like that that kind of (laughs) that kind of process is also happening but it's just happening inside the mind so you know it might be like you know typically compulsive ruminating or like compulsive like checking of like somatic experiences to like verify whether whatever thought you're having is like rings true to your identity or not there's lots of ways of acting out compulsions inside your mind have you written a screenplay or was there a film about based on your experience is that right yeah the my sort of journey to of writing about OCD started in 2013 when I wrote a big feature for the Guardian about the experience of having intrusive thoughts and that really struck a chord with readers from all over the world who who were also experiencing the same thing and also had been feeling too ashamed to speak about it and I turned that article into a book called Pure that was then adapted into a Channel 4 TV series called Pure so yeah that one article ended up having quite a long tail and I still get messages from people who read that article or or the book or who see the show who feel very seen by what we did there so yeah it's been good. (laughs) Well, you certainly spread the word about, the, I, went, I can say demystify, but it's not demystifying, but it's letting people know that they are not alone. And, and I, it's, a, it's from you know, my perspective as a psychiatrist, it's, it's very common that most, many people with this anxiety disorders often feel that they, you know, they are, they're very different. And it turns out they're not very different. You know, that there are a lot of other people who suffer. And that reassurance, as you kind of intimated, helps, but it doesn't get you better. <laughs> It might, mm. might put you in touch with people that perhaps have found ways of healing themselves. Was, is that what happened with you, or did you have to do, go it all alone? Well, after the TV show came out in 2019, you know, the book and the show were really like, re- these were redemption stories. These were the stories of how I, a person like me, can like get a diagnosis and then have therapy and feel better. And by the time the show aired what had happened is that I'd had a, what I characterized at the time as a massive relapse of symptoms and felt myself at rock bottom once again. So whilst this show was being watched by millions of people around the world and I was getting, you know, flooded, my inbox was flooding with messages and well wishes and saying like, you know, you've offered me so much hope. Like, how did you do it? I felt like a fraud because my mental health had, had plummeted once again. So I was left with this sense of like deep cognitive dissonance of like 
feeling like I didn't have a roadmap for getting better anymore. And, you know, how could I be back here having the same intrusive thoughts that I was having, you know, 15 years previous, it just seemed, you know, it really seemed unbearable. And that's when, well, there was lots of catalysts that led me to turning to psychedelics, but psychedelic healing was really one avenue that I hadn't tried. I really felt like I'd exhausted every other, everything else that was available. But quite a brave thing to do. Well, our experience, again, is that the people with OCD tend to be perhaps more naturally more anxious about medicines, new medicine, new, you know, something that might be very challenging to the mind. And so, but you were feeling that desperate, you know, you were prepared to take the risks. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I did have a deep seated fear that I, I would take, do a high dose of psychedelics and lose my mind. But given what I'd been through, given the extent of the suffering, I really feel like I didn't have anything to lose. And, you know, I'm a careful person. I was a careful person then. And I, I tiptoed into it. It's not like I just went and did five grams of mushrooms without knowing what I was doing. And actually, one of the one of the catalysts and one of the moments that I sort of peeped peeped behind the curtain was actually on a meditation retreat when I when my mental health was at rock bottom in 2017 when I and I say this as a a skeptical atheist I had a a sort of a spontaneous mystical experience a sort of what felt like even though I had never done psychedelics at the time what felt like a psychedelic trip and it lasted the best part of two hours and for that two hours it was the first time in 15 years where I hadn't experienced intrusive thoughts. And that was astonishing to me. It was astonishing that those kind of states were accessible. It also, for me, called into question the whole framing of my suffering as illness, because, you know, if, how can the symptoms of an illness just spontaneously subside like that? It was a real sort of earth shaking moment and led me to asking a lot of questions and ultimately interviewing a lot of psychiatrists and neuroscientists and psychedelic healers and going on a, a process of discovery uh, that became my new book, The Maps We Carry. So you did an enormous amount of research before getting your own therapy. Yeah, I mean, I did a lot of research. So actually, and this is where you sort of tie into the story a little bit, um, off the back of that psychedelic trip, well, I, I, I call it a psychedelic trip, that, that sober trip that I had on that meditation retreat, I got very curious about altered states of consciousness and I came to see you talk in 2017 and you were talking about a study that you'd done the previous year in 2016 and that people who have been struggling with mental health problems for a very long time and have been stuck for a very long time sort of report feeling unstuck in the wake of psychedelic experiences and that well, I don't want to put words in your mouth, perhaps it's best that you that you describe this, but that um, that you perhaps saw that the way that psychedelics worked on the brain was that they sort of almost literally like worked to break down some like neuronal like rigidity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm sure I said that. Maybe not as elegantly as you said it. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, and then, and, then I, and then I got very, very curious about is, you know, is this something that could could help me? <laughs> and I proceeded to, I was very, you know, from that point in 2017, when I heard you speak, it was 18 months before I felt confident enough to do a high dose psychedelic. And also not just felt confident enough, but found a way in. I think access is a huge problem because these drugs are illegal and conducting psychedelic therapy is illegal outside of clinical trials. So as a person who's anxious and risk averse, this was a very frightening and lonely landscape to, to navigate. But I, I eventually got there through a huge amount of trial, trial and error. I mean, can you, would you like to say a little bit more about that? I mean, did you I would, of course. grow um, your own or a, hun- a roadmap as opposed to a mind map to, f- you know, you thought maybe psychedelics could help. I w- I'm interested in how, s- how someone actually f- accesses that therapy when it's, there isn't a trial going on. I mean, I'm intrigued to know what you did because um, I'm sure other people would be interested in treading the same path. Yeah. I mean, 
I didn't have any contacts. That was the first thing. So there was a long process of bugging lots of people and asking lots of questions. And I had applied to spaces on clinical trials and for whatever reason, like I hadn't fit the criteria. And I had asked around like locally, did anyone know anyone? And like, you know, for understandable reasons, like the network of uh, underground psychedelics guides in the UK is, it's quite a closed loop and it should be because these people are taking huge risks and, but that makes it quite impenetrable to people who are outside of it. And so what I ended up doing and ultimately I think for me, this was a mistake is that I ended up like taking a punt on a trip sitter whose services I'd seen advertised on, I think it was Gumtree. And, you know, I'd had a phone call with these people before I went and did a five gram dose of mushrooms. It was, it was truffles actually went to Amsterdam, went to their home. And I'm not saying that, you know, this can't ever go well because clearly it can. And it's very dependent on how well, how well an experience is facilitated, but this was not a well facilitated experience. I woke up at the deepest part of the trip in quotes, woke up and I was bashing my fingers against my ears because the music was way too loud and the guides weren't even in the room. So it was actually ended up being quite a traumatizing experience for me. But had that said, it, it was, there was like deep value. There was like treasure at the bottom of the well because the material that came up in that trip for me ended up being very transformative and ended up sort of changing the way that I conceptualized my mental health. And I'm sure we can talk about that a bit more, but yeah, throwing lots of balls up in the air there, I realised. Okay, so you went straight into a, a full psychedelic trip. I went straight in. And I think one of the reasons why I wanted to write my new book is that like, it, I made a lot of mistakes. And I think a lot of people like me are curious about how to do this stuff safely. But there were a lot of pitfalls that could easily have been avoided and that in hindsight, I would do differently. And I think one of the things that I would do differently is that I probably wouldn't go in and do five grams of mushrooms as my first experience. I'm not saying that I would, that's applies to anybody else, but for me, I think I would have started on MDMA, which is the drug that I, that I ended up pivoting to after that very difficult first experience and actually found it a much kind of gentler way in to my trauma, a much more like stable experience. That makes, I think, a lot of sense. But when you talk about, when you're talking about trauma, you're talking about the intrusive thoughts as the trauma or are you talking about something else well it's a good question it's a deep question I mean obviously you don't I don't want you to say anything that no of course I'm, I'm very happy to talk about this stuff so the conclusion I don't want to say conclusion that sounds a bit fixed and firm but one of the insights that I took away from that first experience on mushrooms as as challenging as it was, was that I, I think that my OCD evolved as a sort of defense mechanism against like overwhelming stress in my early life. And that was not, that was not a lens that I'd really screwed on before, because that, that's a very, obviously a very painful thing to think about. But I had grown up sort of characterizing my OCD as this sort of indiscriminate illness, just just a kind of malfunction in my brain that anybody could get like a common cold that was contextualized from my life. And when I started doing high dose psychedelics and the things that came up there for me, I kind of realized, oh, actually the intrusive thoughts evolved as some kind of barrier from or distraction from yeah, a huge amount of pain that I that I was not able to process when I was very young. And I'm happy to talk about that in any detail because I think it's, yeah, it's sort of, it's important. Well, I think you're not alone. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, the experience we're getting in our trials generally is that a lot of enduring mental distress relates to childhood trauma and whether it's physical or psychological. And it's actually a very, very difficult thing to deal with. And as you, you know, it's, it's what your story is, you know, compelling in the sense that your your brain was trying to deal with it, <laughs> or your, it, mm -hmm. it just wasn't dealing with it right. And you wonder how many people end up never dealing with it. You know, end up if you hadn't, they hadn't had the kind of courage and the strength of you to to look for solutions, they would be still 
suffering and as many people do for the rest of their lives. And I think one of the greatest challenges we have in the sort of developing psychedelic therapy, whether it's MDMA and or, or psilocybin, and yeah, I'm very open minded to either. And I can see that one, you know, MDMA is definitely an easier thing to introduce. I mean, as far as I know, no one's ever done an MDMA study in people with OCD. Bizarre, but maybe your comments then will change that. But but obviously, not surprising given the, this this ridiculous illegal status of it but dealing with trauma trauma is such a central phenomenon to to everything we you know we have to deal with almost is there anyone who has sort of mental distress who hasn't got some degree of trauma and then the distress itself becoming tra- comes traumatizing it so yeah i think insights that you have into how we as a profession you know as a psychiatrist can help deal with that we really gratefully receive we we've tended to try to avoid it because we don't know what to do and maybe psychedelics are the, the first time we've got tools to help work, work it through I'd, I'd really value any insights you have well you know I had to I sort of I had to fight quite hard <laughs> for this in in terms of you know I I grew up through a psychiatric system that was perpetuating a certain worldview a certain way of seeing mental health problems and I I sort of I thought there was something wrong with my brain. I thought there was something fundamentally wrong with my brain. I thought that I had an illness like any other illness. And I thought that the route to salvation was through medication and therapy that treated the symptoms of that illness. And I think that's a quite simplistic story. And, uh, but, you know, and a, a comforting one. So I understand why it's been perpetuated. But, you know, in a way, mental health problems are like way more mysterious and complex and contextual than than I realized and that I think that that doctors generally admit you know because you know doctors are psychiatrists work in medicine <laughs> and there needs to be something wrong with people in order to administer medicine to like solve that problem and I think that that way of seeing has not been working for decades now and I and um yeah, and we know that, and we know medicines have value, but they're rarely curative in the mm-hmm. way, you know, and, and, and probably because they don't get to these core issues that, that you experience. But you may, but, but what's interesting, of course, is that you, I don't know whether you didn't put the two, two together for 15 years. Is that because the, the prime, you know, the, the, the childhood stuff, had you just forgotten about it or had you? repressed it or had you just thought there's nothing I can do about it so it's kind of just me I mean, I don't, I mean in, now in hindsight how do you view what your 15 yeah. year old self 18 year old self thought about it yeah it's so it's so mysterious so through my psychedelic trips essentially what I, I never like recovered any like new autobiographical information about my life there was no recovered memories it was all stuff that I already knew but it just got completely reframed and recontextualized. And I started to appreciate feelings. I, I suppose what I think had been repressed was the feet with, with the feelings. So, you know, my I grew up with a mom who was in and out of psychiatric hospital and had herself been given a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. So at home throughout my childhood, I was seeing and hearing very distressing things, very disturbing things that left me with a sense of sort of, you know, a a kind of a a crushing uncertainty. But I never, as a kid, I never really felt any of that stuff. And I, those feelings, I think, got locked up for a very long time. And so I, throughout my teens and twenties, I always knew on one level, on a, on a sort of cognitive conceptual level, oh yeah, I had, there, there were difficult times when I was growing up. And I think probably mom's illness like really impacted my mental health but it was like the knowledge was kind of like somehow like marooned on an island that I couldn't reach and how I describe like psychedelics action you know MDMA in particular kind of like opened up a main line to that pain for the first time in a couple of decades and it was that's why doing psychedelics like felt almost like a kind of like a homecoming into pain. It wasn't, um, it wasn't novel. The epiphanies, it was like, it was like arriving at a place where a part of me had been waiting for a long time. Like I already knew I just hadn't felt it before. And it 
blew my mind <laughs> how painful it was. Yeah, well, and in a good way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just to maybe go, you know, defend the sort of neurological model you know, a little bit. I think what you, which, you know, you could interpret what you were saying about these thoughts as, as, as emerging from a process of, of repression that you were, you were, you've been trying as since childhood not to confront the trauma that your mother's illness was presenting to you because you couldn't do anything about it. You know, it was, you know, you was, you were functioning. I mean, you, you know, you survived, you got to university, you're obviously articulate, intelligent, successful writer, you know, so you, in a way you were sort of encapsulating your emotions and that probably used quite a lot of brain circuitry that ended up becoming maladaptive when it started to go into themes that weren't particularly, you know, which were not particularly well, destructive and damaging. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, everything that we're talking about obviously inv- involves like brain circuitry. There's, there's plenty going on at that level of analysis and it's an important level of analysis, but um you can't make sense of the neurology without the phenomenology and without the emotional content and without the the personal meaning layered onto that. And I think it's you know, psych- But also, I'm interested in in what you about because getting to the source. One of the big debates that's been going on in psychiatry all my life is that childhood trauma is there. It's very prevalent, but we can't do anything about it. And that and that's one of the reasons psychiatrists, psychotherapists tend not to talk about it because they don't know what to do. You know, you've done something. You've done something that has enabled you to deal with it. And that's what I'm kind of hoping we can achieve for a lot of people with psychedelic therapy. That's really, you know, I think that might be the ultimate value of psychedelic therapy to deal with those early traumas. I mean, I'd be interested in your opinions on that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, this whole idea of like processing trauma is, is, is an interesting, it's an interesting one. Like, do you ever get to a point where it's like processed? There's a psychologist called James Hillman, and he sort of, he sort of takes issue with this whole idea of processing trauma. It's not like something that gets processed in a factory and like refined, like it's, it's coarseness can be instructive. You just have to look at it from different angles. And I think psychedelics can be really helpful tools because, you know, in a way, I think my whole life, I was like running from these feelings. You know, I think my OCD was a sophisticated, like system wide mechanism to run from the feelings. And even just the act of turning around and saying, I'm not going to run from you anymore, is completely repivots the conversation. And I think that's a deeply empowering thing, because it's really, really scary. If you're an anxious person, it's really, really scary to go over the top like that. Yeah, and it, absolutely, it's scary, and I'll come back to that in a minute with OCD. But, but yes, that's an experience. I think that many of our depressed patients in our studies have said that they didn't realise they were repressing things. They didn't realise that they, they maybe because they were scared, or you know, probably because, you know, well, they couldn't do anything about it. They and and certainly psilocybin seemed to allow them to go where they even have been avoiding going. And as you say, yeah, I mean, it, it, well, I mean, reprocessing is, is, you know, you're right, not the right term. It's about maybe understanding the challenge, understanding the reason, understanding it in itself, help, what you think you're saying is it means it wasn't, it's not your brain gone wrong. It's what happened to you and you're dealing with that. And so at least you understand personally the, the origins and the, and, and the causation of, uh, of your, um, your, you know, your current mental mental experiences. And that, and that in itself, it means you're in the right place to start, doesn't it? Yeah. And I think, you know, for me, there was like a, there was a, pro- a profound compassion emerged from the insight that like, you know, maybe my, maybe my OCD was not, was not something that set out to terrorize me and bully me. Maybe it wasn't a disease. Maybe on some level, it was quite an ingenious mechanism that evolved to, uh, on some level to try and keep me safe and to try and protect me from something that would have otherwise overwhelmed me and broken me yes so it didn't I think it's not we need a whole it's like we need a whole different model to be able to talk about this stuff because it's not like it cured the symptoms it just changed the aperture yeah no, that's a that's a really good yeah a, a good way of, of of putting it but it also allowed you to say in a way you could see the whole picture you weren't just it wasn't just a narrow 
yeah, the whole picture and, you know, and it wasn't as simple as, oh, I just realized that like, that my mom's illness like had a very negative impact on me. It was like also recognizing that like, you know, my mom with her distress, she was just also a node in a system and like her distress was in part caused by the fact that there were privatizations of the industry in the Midlands that put my dad out of work, the fact that the school system was shit and that my brother who had learning difficulties was not being helped at school. So it was, I think the trauma conversation can sometimes like shine quite a narrow light on like single issues, but actually what emerged from my psychedelic experiences was quite a rich, like broad, like tapestry of like causation. And taking the, taking the blame off helpful as well. Was that part of the, feeling better it's not the blame off myself so blame off yourself yeah yeah i yeah for sure for sure definitely and so what advice would you give people then would you suggest starting with mdma which is slightly harder to get currently than the psilocybin in 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 the netherlands or and how frequently what what would you think the ideal protocol might be if we were going to do a trial for instance because because you know we have let me just for the for, for the audience who don't know we have we have just finished a trial of people with ocd but we haven't used with psilocybin but we've used a, a non-psychedelic dose because our the expert patients that we had guiding us for the protocol development were, were very concerned that they didn't want to have a trip Mm-hmm. And so, you know, obviously, we had to you know, take their advice and and go with a non trip dose and see if if that's what we call a psycholytic dose was able to to help them deal or use the the current model, which is a CBT based model, better. But we, our original our original you know supposition and hope was that we get a bigger effect if if people did what you did, and and so your guidance for the next trial would be very helpful. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's very understandable that like trial participants would be scared of the trip. <laughs> you know, it, I think fear is appropriate here. Like, you know, it's it, there's a reason why we're sort of we're scared of the material that might surface because like, you know, often this is stuff that, as I said before, that we've been running from. I can only really speak to like what worked for me, but like ultimately it was that the higher doses were the most challenging but they they were also the most radiant the most blissful the most comforting the most transformative you know to go back to the comment we made earlier you would you'd be supportive of, of giving a, a, a trial a starting a trial of mdma then would you yeah i mean the thing is like absolutely i would obviously mdma has been trialed for ptsd but i mean you know given everything that we, we've been speaking about today you know one way of conceptualizing OCD is is a kind of manifestation of trauma also and you know arguably the sort of demarcations between OCD and PTSD as set out by the DSM are fairly arbitrary anyway and like these are not like objective uh, homogenous categories so I think I I certainly see I certainly see a huge amount of potential for MDMA with people who have obsessions and compulsions yeah would you think what one or two? I mean, the sort of maps model, and maybe three. I don't know. I'm I'm genuinely interested in how you would design. <laughs> if I was would, back, bring you in I, as your, our expert patient. If you yeah, like. if you want to hire me as a consultant, we can do that. We don't pay much. We do pay expert patients, but we don't probably we don't pay <laughs> enough to make a job out of it. <laughs> if I was doing it again, I would probably do six sessions of guided MDMA, probably followed by three big psilocybin doses. Well, that's going to be far, far too expensive for the trial, but, but it's <laughs> good to know. <laughs> look, maybe look out for a philanthropist to do that. Obviously, with like plenty of space between, between each dose. But also, I mean, there's something else that I want to say in that, like, you know, I do think that psychedelics can be incredibly helpful, but what I don't really see much emphasis on is like, the kind of the 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 social conditions that are necessary and supportive to help people like after the trip you know we talk about psychedelic integration like it's a kind of you know a protocol a therapeutic intervention but actually I think really what makes good psychedelic integration is like just what makes 
you know, a, a healthy life full stop. Like, you, you know, people need to be really well, like held by their communities. You know, ideally, they need to be like moving their bodies in a way that feels safe. You know, they need to they need to have like a sense of purpose. They need to have enough like financial resources. And like my concern with the, the kind of a kind of medicalized psychedelics model is that if we don't emphasize those things, like people will take these psychedelics and they'll initially have these profound experiences that will make them feel better in the short term. And then we'll send them back to shitty lives. And inevitably, because we don't stop being reactive to stress, those people will inevitably suffer again. And that's and that's my concern is that Oh, it's our concern too. You're not alone in that. It's yeah, of course. Concern. And I think that is the big elephant in the room now with this therapy, for the reasons you've just pointed out, but also because it's so novel that there aren't very many people who've had it to provide the kind of support to others. You know, so, and it's come to quite a. It's become discussed quite a lot recently in relation to to the war in Ukraine where you have, you know, there are millions, millions of traumatized people and how you, how you deal with trauma in a population as opposed to a person is, is really challenging. And you, it can't simply be that, you know, everyone gets a, a short course and then they're left, you know, we have to bring communities together to, to provide ongoing support and healing, don't we? And, and so yeah, you know, well, if it's not in your current book, can it be in your next one? <laughs> <laughs> it is in my current book. That's yeah, that's, tell me the answer then, right? We, well, no, I, I don't. I don't have the answer. Obviously, I'm exploring all these things, but you know, one of the one of the things I speculate about, and I I, I did a Radio Four series called One to One recently, and I spoke about this there, and ended up getting quite emotional on air about it because it's a very emotional thing for me. But, you know, I speculate about like, imagine if like psychedelic therapy had been available to like my mother when she was like at her worst. Now, like, would it have helped her like work through some of her interpersonal traumas from her early life? Like, probably. But like, when she came back home, like my dad would still have been out of work. The school system would still have been letting my brother down she would still have been isolated. And the idea that, you know, someone in that kind of position could be sold a kind of magic bullet and then be let down in the same way that people with mental health problems have been let down by psychiatric institutions for decades, like that's heartbreaking to me. So I think we need to be a little bit measured in the way we talk about this stuff. And if we're not like making social changes, then it's kind of all pointless. Well, it's not, I would disagree. It's completely pointless because, but I would agree it's not ideal. And I mean, we know that we can predict 50% of mental illness from where you're born. And, and from where you're born? Effectively, yeah. I mean, you know, through the, so, you know, the, you know, the location, the socioeconomic surroundings, you know, we, we know that they have enormous, enormous impact. And society, we've known that. We've known that probably since we started collecting data in the 50s. What we've struggled with is doing anything about it. And, and that's a political decision. And maybe in the end, it has to be, I mean, maybe we can change, you know, maybe a new government, maybe more concern about mental health, having, you know, bringing back cabinet minister with mental health kind of brief. We need to, yeah, we absolutely need to do things, but we, and it has to be across the board. But what I suppose what, from my perspective, going down the, Arguing with politicians, as I've found, is not, I've not been very good at that. You might be better at that. But getting community, trying to bring communities together to, to, to do it themselves, or to, that may, you know, that, that's where the Ukraine issue is. It, has, it can only happen with communities there. And maybe, you know, we, we could start piloting that here as well. Yeah. And, you know, if you look at the way that like psychedelics have been used in a huge variety of ways by indigenous cultures for centuries like the you know they they tend to be used in uh, it's very context specific to like the traditions and rituals of those societies this is very very bedded in and integrated into community it tend not to be yeah it tends not to be seen as a psych as, as a as a as a therapeutic intervention as such it's more of a way of life and i think where we want to be aiming in a few decades time is, you know, this, the knowledge about how to do psychedelics safely is kind of open sourced 
so that like, you know, sovereign adults can make choices about about taking these drugs with the people that they care about most and, and know that they can do that in a safe way. So that it doesn't necessarily have to be something that you go into a professional's office for. Again, I wouldn't dispute that at all. I mean, you're reminding me of uh, Alder, you know, Aldous Huxley and, you know, my favourite book of his island. You know, that programme, a programme of, of yoga, of psychology, of exercise and of mushka is seemed to produce a rather impressive outcome from in the in the mind <laughs> in the book but i have little doubt little doubt that it would be something we could re eat seriously roll out if we took if we if we cared enough and it, you know i mean it will take people like you who've actually are sort of flag bearers of that the both the experience and the vision to, to do that i'm too old now but you're not too old, Dave. I, well, I, but I, I can at least, you know, at least I've started the people moving in the right direction. We could certainly do an awful lot to make the world a much nicer place for most people if we used all the resources we have. But sadly, we seem to be almost going backwards at present. But you know, let's hope it's just a transient, a blip. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's when you start like talking, when you start having conversations about mental health like this, it it almost it, you know it's it starts to feel so like impossibly vast and complex, doesn't it? It's quite easy to get um, deflated because it's like, you know, what we're really talking about is like, you know, we're really talking about policy change and like wholesale, like social reform and like, and it's, um, it's daunting and, and, you know, it's, it involves like collective effort. <laughs> yeah, it does actually. Absolutely. A, a lot of, uh, I suppose the one sort of bright spark is, is the Oregon experiment. I think we can, we can, let you, we'll finish the conversation about what, I mean, Oregon is trying to do that. Oregon mushrooms, wellness centers, fascinating, fascinating social experiment. Obviously in one of the richest places in the world. Yeah. If, so if it's going to work there, it's going to work. <laughs> yeah. I'm, really, I'm interested in your thoughts on that because it does seem to me that's a, a I like um I mean like I'm fully on board with m- more holistic with broader approaches to you know psychedelic medicine that 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 are paying attention to people's need for community and things like exercise and dance and yoga and breath work and like I think that's great and I really support that but there is also reason that like those kind of experiments are happening in like the the, the most privileged parts of the world it's because like most people are actually just too busy working to try and make enough money to survive to be like doing breath work and yoga like it's like um you know these are it's privilege it's a privilege to be able to have the space sometimes the physical space let alone the headspace to be able to engage in these kind of like wellness activities so you know it's a question of again it's a, well, where we started the conversation talking about access it's a mm. and schools really i mean you know it's disappointing I mean, I you know, I, I remember in the being at school, you know, dance and exercise was music. You know, it was that was the fun bit of the curriculum. We seem to have kind of lost the understanding of the movement and and music. Yeah, are so therapeutic oh, and and not necessarily therapeutic, but also they kind of build a model. I go back to the brain. They probably help your brain deal with other things better too. Yeah, definitely. And you know, dance dance for me became a really important part of um, of healing from very serious mental health problems. You know, just actually like you know, the other thing with MDMA is it makes you it, it's a t- puts you in touch with your bodily sensations in a new way. If you're used to not feeling your body, I mean, it can be very helpful to have some kind of physical practice that that helps you express. Well, look, thanks so much for sharing it. You know, and and but more importantly, thanks for uh, writing the book and. <laughs> writing the articles, making the programs. And if we can promote your vision, we will do that. Thanks again, Rose. Thanks, Dave. Uh, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Well, keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you.